todos parabéns. Um, aquilo que nós vimos aqui um, ilustra-nos de uma certa forma um, um convoca-nos para uma noção do tempo. Parece que o tempo não não é o mesmo para diferentes pessoas, mesmo que elas coexistam, convivam, partilhem o espaço físico. O, o, o tempo é contado de outra maneira, significa outras coisas. Em alguns momentos parece que estamos no mesmo sítio, na mesma altura, mas separados por uh, décadas de, de diferença entre as pessoas. Um, é um retrato, uh, como dizia a Ana Sofia Fonseca, é um retrato de pessoas uh, e é uma espécie de um fresco de um país que nem sempre uh, conhecemos. E o nosso mundo é muito diferente, de facto, não é? A maior empresa de transportes do mundo, e com isto avanço, a Uber não tem um único carro. Os motoristas da Uber não são trabalhadores da empresa Uber. A maior empresa de hotelaria do mundo não tem um único hotel. É o Airbnb. O maior supermercado no mundo não tem nenhuma loja física. É a Amazon. Aliás, tem uma loja física recente, mas onde não há funcionários humanos, como sabem, é só robôs. Eu sou um cliente da Uber e da Cabify, destas plataformas todas, e também utilizo ocasionalmente taxistas, os táxis convencionais. E gosto sempre muito de, de puxar uma conversa, ou ocasionalmente, consumando também, me parecer, o, o, a atitude e o género do condutor, do taxista, porque muitas vezes eles reconhecem-me da minha profissão. Sou jornalista de televisão há bastantes anos e, portanto, as pessoas reconhecem -me. E dá uma conversa muito interessante, que eu pergunto como é que está o negócio em função das plataformas, e eles dizem, pá, isto sabe como é, isto é uma tragédia, muito difícil, concorrência desleal, seguros, carros, licenças, e eu digo assim, sabe, eu percebo muito bem que eu tenho exatamente o mesmo problema que você. Assim, eles olham pelo retrovisor e assim, não, você só pode estar a gozar comigo. Não, tenho exatamente o mesmo problema, já reparou, o seu maior concorrente é uma empresa que não tem nenhum táxi. Não é? O meu maior concorrente, um dos meus maiores concorrentes, é o YouTube, que nunca uh, investiu um cêntimo na produção de um vídeo original. Mas é o maior distribuidor de vídeo do mundo. Uh, e isso coloca-nos, em larga medida, no mesmo, uh, na mesma plataforma, no mesmo nível de desafio face ao futuro. Quem é que são os novos trabalhadores? Que direitos têm? Quem os defende? Aliás, como é que se defende os direitos perante um patrão que não se vê, nem se sabe quem é muitas vezes? E, e, e que fica noutro sítio qualquer do mundo. Um, vou chamar ao palco os nossos próximos convidados para debater precisamente este tema, o Estado Social nos Tempos da Uber. Eu começo por chamar Jean Pisani Ferry, um, professor de Economia na Universidade de Sciences Po de Paris e um dos redatores do programa eleitoral de Emmanuel Macron. Bienvenue. Okay. Merci. O investigador e professor de Economia e Estratégia na London School of Economics and Political Science, Luís Garicano. Did I spell it correctly? Okay. Welcome. Please have a seat. Obrigado. Uh, e Juan José do Lado. Professor de Economia no Instituto Universitário Europeu, eh, investigador sénior do Centro de Estudos de Política Económica e do Instituto para o Estudo do Trabalho. Bem-vindo. Para moderar o debate, chamo ao palco o Pedro Magalhães, investigador principal no Instituto de Ciências Sociais da Universidade de Lisboa. Boa tarde, Pedro. Olá, boa tarde. Vem com o microfone debaixo do braço. Olá, boa tarde. Eu, eu prometo que já explico para quem não sabe o que é isto, mas não vou explicar já, vou deixar um bocadinho de suspense. E antes de começar o debate, queria só dizer-vos que todos nós aqui, e eu próprio, temos a sorte enorme de termos aqui sentadas três das pessoas que mais pensaram, que mais escreveram, que mais sabem sobre este assunto. Portanto, eu vou ter a sorte de lhes poder fazer perguntas, mas no final da sessão também vocês vão fazer vão poder fazer perguntas depois de os ouvirmos. So now I'm switching to English. Uh, hello to the three of you. Thank you for being here. I, I think that the first thing that we need to deal with uh, before we start thinking about big consequences, big impact, is to define 
what we are talking about. So we look at this title, The Age of Uber. So what is really this age of Uber? What does it, people talk about the sharing economy, people talk about platforms, all these different things. So I will start by asking Jean, what are we talking about? What is the importance and nature of this phenomenon? Um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we're talking about various things, but you know, if you start with Uber, we're talking about a change in the nature of the firm. A firm was supposed to be a place where people would come for a certain part of the day, normally a certain fixed part of the day, and they would work under the supervision of someone assigned by the firm, and that would be a very hierarchical way of, of, of working. And that would be completely different from the uh, independent world where you're your you're own master and you're selling products to the yeah. market. And here we're speaking of a new, a new arrangement whereby you're, on the one hand, you're independent. You decide if you go to work or not. You, know, you're, you don't have working hours. Uh, you, you're directly in relationship with a client. You don't have a boss, mm -hmm. but you have a platform, and this platform determines the kind of service you're offering and the price at which you're offering it. So I think the question is, first, what that? I mean, what, what the potential of it? It's tiny for the time being. Huh? It's a very, it's very small part of an uh, It's still small. As it's very small. It's uh, you know, less than 1%. Uh, but it's very small. But can it grow? Can it be a, become a generic model? And even if not, how do we deal with this form of uh, work that uh, you know, is so different from everything we, we used to know? Yes. Yeah. So Juan, this, the same question, but in a sense adding the questions that uh, Jean uh, already introduced, which is we, we, what is the nature of this phenomenon for you and where do you see it potentially spreading to other activities, to other ways of regulating the, the provision of services? Well, the, the definition of what's being called the gig economy, the gig is something which is what's related to musicians who are playing concerts uh, here and there, today at the pub, tomorrow at the, at the, at the rock place or whatever. This was a gig. So basically the definition is something that opposes the standard concept of uh, 8 to 4 or 9 to 5 job which is a, a lifelong career. Now we are going to, to, to practice all these uh, tasks, skills, separately, today here, tomorrow there, and so on and so forth. So this is really what is uh, challenging in this yeah. definition. So for instance, when you look at the share of this uh, gig economy uh, in Europe or in the US, you, you find very contrasting numbers. Because some people just define it as anything different from dependent work, from the nine to five mm -hmm. job. And therefore, you are including Huge. freelancers, you are including part-time workers, you are including um, uh, uh, temporary contract holders, temporary work agencies, and so on and so forth. Whereas also, uh, what I think one should distinguish between what we believe is a primary source of income versus a secondary source of income. So in my extra time, when I get out of the office, then I, I may drive a, a yeah, car yeah. or whatever it is. So the, the definition is a bit loose at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and that is going to have implications, for instance, for the reforms of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. And of course, what we know for sure, whether it's 1% or less than 1% to 35%, some, uh, some other studies uh, place this estimate, is that it's a growing and changing phenomenon, mm -hmm. okay? Involving many heterogeneous forces, from robotics to 3D printing, through apps, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. which have different implications. And that, I think that has to be taken into account, into, the, into consideration when we talk about the welfare state. Very well. Louise, the same question to you, but also cutting on something that was discussed here right now, which is how big this is. This is not the only manifestation of how technological change is impacting work, it's impacting the social welfare. So I would ask you to talk a little bit about that too. So indeed, the, when you look at, uh, good morning everybody and thanks for being here. When you look at, at the welfare state, uh, at what is going to affect our welfare state, and, and how technology is changing, you've seen, indeed, as my two colleagues pointed out, two really distinct things that are happening at the same time. 
One is this platform economy, indeed, which I think, as Jean said, in terms of people who actually earn money from this platform economy, we all use platforms for different things. But a lot of the usage is, is not involving actual work, uh, remunerated work. Maybe one third of people have been involved with platforms, as Juan was said, but maybe only one to five percent of people actually have in, been involved in remunerated work. Um, so that's part of what we see, these platforms, and people exchanging services, and platforms are not something new. You think of yellow pages, some people would put their ads in the yellow pages and people would find the jobs that they needed to do. Or if you, want, you think of the advertising section of the newspaper, you would put an ad there saying you wanted to rent your house and somebody would look in there and actually find a house there. So those things have just been growing, but they have existed before. The other side, which is also not completely new, but has been changing a lot uh, indeed, is automatization. David Autor will talk about that tonight, uh, and I recommend you to listen to him since he's the, the person who's most written about it and who knows most about it uh, in the world. And uh, the, the thing that is really kind of an order of magnitude larger than the gig economy, the thing is really going to change our lives massively, drastically, is the increase that artificial intelligence and machine learning automatization is bringing not just to some jobs, but to all of our jobs. Uh, everything is going to be done, or a lot of jobs are going to be done in different ways, especially knowledge work. And the thing that provides, that makes people very anxious and makes people wonder what's going on, is that the magnitude of this is, is, is very large. So talking about figures, as you said, uh, there is one estimate with some Oxford uh, people who are kind of, it's, it's a bit of a joke because even they say they went too far. <laughs> but they kind of made this, this, this uh, uh, they took 702 jobs and they kind of tried to figure out how many jobs would be affected by this. And they came up with 50%. They said 50% of jobs, 47% of jobs would disappear. That seems crazy. McKinsey has done another report uh, this year, uh, 2017, where they say one third of the jobs is going to be affected between now and 2030. So, I mean, I think these numbers are still very large, and these numbers are missing something crucial, which is at the same time as some jobs disappear, many other jobs appear. We didn't know what a community manager was before, and we now have people who are community job managers professionally. So, the magnitude is large, the impact will be very fast, and I think that's what's new now. What's new now is that we've had technological change for many years, we've had automation for many years, but now we feel, many of us think that this technology is going to be affecting a wider range of jobs and in a faster time frame probably than before. Very good. So Juan, I wanted to start with you in the follow-up. You are one of the foremost labor economists in Europe. So I wanted to ask you this. We have things we call labor market institutions, collective bargaining minimum wage, uh, workers' rights, different types of contracts in different countries, different situations. How do you think, well, number one, how do you think these institutions are changing, but perhaps most importantly, how do you think they should change? How do they need to change to accommodate this sort of transformations? Uh, in this respect, I'll, uh, I'll go back to what Luis was saying, and I think it's important to distinguish between automation and yes. the platform economy. Yes. Automation is what is in the mind of people as a threat in the short run. People are going to lose their jobs. They are going to be re replaced by, by robots, which are now not just uh, machines that move, but also machines that think, that can think. Right? Because uh, with the development of big data, this is what the machines get as, 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 an, as the main tool, and then with the artificial intelligence, they start reasoning. So th the threat for those are this, of course, how these workers which are going to be displaced are going to find jobs elsewhere. And there will be new jobs, jobs that we haven't thought about, because after all, there have been three industrial revolutions. This is the, 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 the fourth one. Uh, and we learn throughout history, of course, that uh, despite the fact that um, 
Many people in the UK during the, during the first industrial revolution lost their jobs the, with the arrival of the spinning, Jenny, yeah. and so on and so forth. They later on found their jobs, like the typists who, found, who lost their jobs when uh, uh, processors arrived and so on. They, yeah. they found the job elsewhere. There will be jobs both in the robots and in the platform uh, economy and also new jobs that we haven't thought of yet. Mm -hmm. So there, I think the issue is, of course, how the welfare state is going to affect the transition from uh, the current situation to the situation we'll see in 10, 20 years where all the adjustment has taken place, the transitional phase. That, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. And I think in a, in a period where, at least in, well, in Europe, uh, fiscal consolidations and debt overhang, etc., are crucial phenomena. That's a, a really a real challenge. The second one is, of course, how are we going to prepare uh, our workers to deal with the skills which are needed by these new jobs? And there, for instance, reforms of the education system that uh, later on we can discuss, I think uh, yeah. they are going to be crucial in that respect. And then, of course, given that the nature of these uh, new activities is going to is a little bit unknown, there is a discussion about changing some particular specific tools of the welfare state, and people start talking at, about the universal basic income, yes. they start talking about social dividends, and so on and so forth. And I think uh, this is uh, just a reflection of the fact of this uncertainty. We know at the end there will be no employment losses, there will be even employment gains. But you we don't so. know what is going to happen. In the Economists meantime. always discuss what we call a steady state. It's when, when you reach a new state of nature uh, where everything remains the same. But we try to ignore all this transition and the transition is going to be tough. And we have to cope with that. So, I mean, uh, Juan gave us a guide of, of, of topics that we need to try and cover until in the time that we have, but let's try not to do this, everything at the same time. So there's the issue of the transition. Yeah. So what, what welfare state tools and policies do we need to make sure that people's lives, social cohesion in a sense, is preserved in the, in the course of this transformation? So let's start with that. What's your view, Luis? So, um, the, the, uh, uh, I think in the, in the policy uh, arena, and, and you probably have seen this, uh, participate in some of these debates, there, there have been, as, as Juan, Juan was, was, was suggesting, there have been a lot of people putting on the table new ideas. And some of these ideas are, are, quite, are quite interesting and, and, and worth thinking about. Let me just, just, just put three that are being kind of debated among, and maybe my colleagues can can, can discuss some of, some of those. So one is, of course, uh, the universal basic income. So you're a citizen of Portugal, and because you're a citizen of Portugal, you get a citizenship wage. Everybody earns some money. Uh, that allows them, I mean, the, the advantage of this is that, look, you don't have to be scared for technology, etc. Everybody's going to earn, let's say, 10,000 euros, just from being Portuguese, a year and then they can decide what to do with their lives. Okay? That, the advantage of this is that it gives you freedom, it gives you the ability to pursue and the, to pursue your lives and your goals, etc. And it allows you to work on the non-profit non sector or to take care of your kids, etc. Now, the disadvantages obviously are costs. It's very expensive. You multiply 10,000 by uh, 5 million uh, active people in Portugal or something like that. I mean, you're going to get very, very fast uh, to well, what, 50 billion in a 200 billion economy, that's a very large increase in the welfare state. Can we pay that? How do we pay that, etc.? Many people think it's going to be very hard to pay. The second issue with the universal basic income is the incentives that people have. Well, you know, my sons, they love video games. If you give them 10,000 euros when they are 18 years old, they're probably going to go into their cave and just be playing video games all day long, right? They will never get any skills. They will never get out of the house. So that's, that's a problem. And the third issue is kind of the meaning of life, right? Do we want to live in a society? Do, will people be happy in a society where there are lots of people who are unemployed and, and just earning this? this, this Let me just say, uh, this is uh, the European Social Survey ran. Uh, one of the uh, yeah. modules was precisely about this. Yeah. And one of the sources of resistance to the idea of universal basic income is the notion of, of 
conditionality. That people need to deserve. Deserve so, it. So yeah. this is something That's very, very natural. This is something very ingrained in people's views. It's perhaps yeah. another obstacle. Yeah. So that's universal basic income. A second thing that has been discussed has been uh, a jobs warranty. This is now very big in the United States, I think less in the European debate. Jobs warranty is the state says everybody has the right to work okay. at this wage. And everybody can, can, can find a job. And if they don't find it, we'll give it. Now, the good thing of that is indeed it feels more reciprocal. Like, OK, you're going to work. Um, another good thing is it puts a, a floor on what, you, on what you're going to earn in your conditions. If some employer is too brutal or not good or whatever, he won't get any workers because people can do these other jobs. What are the bad things? The bad thing, I think, is the political economy. Like, the state suddenly employs all these people, and the state becomes this kind of uh, jobs for the boys and jobs for the friends and this kind of, you know, it's, it's scary. I'm, I find it scary. And also, it kind of, it's going to compete with the whole welfare state. It's going to become like, okay, so if you don't work, are you going to earn something? It's, it's tricky to, 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 to see it implemented. And the third, which the one I have proposed, I, I've done a little bit of a similar job, job as Jean. I'm writing the, the, I'm the person in charge of the economic program of Ciudadanos in Spain. And the one that we put in Spain, Ciudadanos, is a negative income tax, yeah. similar to the United States and its income tax credit. You, over 12,000 euros, you pay normal tax. Below 12,000 euros, you get, you pay a negative tax. The state is going to fill up the difference between 12,000 and what you earn. It's going to add a little bit so that you're not so much below. And in that way, yes, you have to work. You have to be doing something, but you're not going to earn below certain levels. So I think those are the three things on the table. And clearly, I prefer the third one because of incentives, because of cost, because it lets people be attached to the labor market. And I think that's, that's probably the best, at least, policy, policy right now. So Jean, it's the, the, the big question is how do we reap the benefits of this technological change? How do we give people the right incentives? How do we benefit from this dy dynamics? But preserve social cohesion. Do you like any of these proposals? No, I think I basically agree with what uh, Louis said. I mean, the, uh, uh, the universal basic income, there, there are two versions of it. I mean, there, there is a version of the people who think, let's replace the welfare state with a minimum basic income. So, you know, you're going to get your 10,000, and you ta you're taking care yeah. of your health care, you're taking care of health, your pension, everything. you're taking care of, you know, when you're unemployed or not. The state is simply not responsible for all that. And that's, a, let's call it the right-wing version. Mm -hmm. and, then, and that's affordable, that we can afford that. I mean, we have it's to not remove going to, all. We remove all the yeah, rest. Yeah, yeah. You remove all the rest and you say, okay. Uh, the question is, you know, I mean, are we covering the risks in the, in the right way? Are we, I mean, is it going to be uh, uh, adequate in terms of the, the, the risk of illness, uh, adequate in terms of the risk of, you know, not being able to save enough for your pension, etc. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the risk of that is that we'll find quite a lot of people in difficult situation because they are not able to really take care of the management of all, all this, this risk. So the left-wing version, or the extreme left-wing version, is let's, let's do it on top of yes. the rest. And that's simply we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's not, on the whole, that's not a very good idea. <laughs> that's, that's tempting because if you imagine a future in which the machines would do everything for us, then at some point this may be you know, a relevant uh, uh, solution. But certainly not today. Certainly not for the, you know, as, a, as a practical program. Now, I very much agree with this idea of uh, you know, having an incentive-based minimum income that preserves a marginal incentive to work. I mean, that's something uh, on which we, we made many mistakes because we introduced minimum, minimum incomes conditional on, uh, on not uh, finding a work. And then if you start finding work, you lose your income. And then you lose what the municipality gives you in terms of access to, I don't know, uh, free, um, uh, free lunches for your kids at, at school. And you need your, your affordable house because you exceed this. And then there is no incentive to work. So I think it's, it's absolutely essential that the society sends the right signal in terms of Whatever you're going to earn through working, a sufficient part of it is going to remain for you. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, you can't tax, you know, 90% of what you're, you're, you're going to earn at work. And even some people say, well, this is a very 
economic way of looking at things. People work because they like to work. Work has a social value. I fully agree with all that. Uh, people, you know, they, they want to work because they find that's, uh, you know, the way to participate in society. But our responsibility is to make sure that you don't lose by doing that. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, that the society sends the incentives at the right incentive consistent with the values of the society. So I think that's an important thing to do. And you know, that's part of what's being done in France, that's part of, uh, that has been done in the UK, that's been done in many countries. And it's, it's, it's hard work because you know, it's all, all tinkering to make sure that uh, everything being taken into account, you don't lose uh, by, by working or you, go, you gain uh, enough. Um, so I would say that. Now, um, going back a bit to the, um, the, the Uber dimension thing, uh, we've got a problem with access to, um, uh, to social security, to, to, to the welfare, because it has been based historically on uh, the situation as an employee. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's status dependent. Um, so, for example, I mean, it's worse in the US than in Europe, because in the US, your access to health care depends on your employment status. In Europe, it's fairly, it's fairly universal. So it's not really a problem. If you're an Uber driver in the U.S., forget about it. You don't have uh, you don't have em yeah, employer I mean, provided yeah, I mean, the medical if insurance. Poor, if you're poor, if you're out of work, you have access to, to it. You know, through minimum yeah. uh, insurance. And then if you're in a big company, you're, you're you're getting access to it. I mean, that's what Obama tried to, to yeah, solve, yeah, but yeah. very partially. Yeah. Now we don't have this problem in Europe with healthcare, but we do have a problem, let's say, for uh, uh, unemployment. You know, these people. You're an Uber driver. And then somehow, you know, the economy goes down, there are less clients, uh, or uh, there's a competitor emerging, and you lose, in fact, your source of income. But you're not technically unemployed. Yeah. You're still there, you're still, you know, driving your car. And how are you going to get access to these unemployment benefits? And that, we don't have a very good solution to that, because you can base it on income. Say, so there is a drop in income, you're going to get access to something. But that's, you know, that's not, that's, there is, as we say, moral hazard, because they, the driver can decide to work less, and then you know that's his choice or her choice, and that's not uh, an external event. So for an employee, it's easy. You lose your job. You're out of your job. Then you're entitled for an um, unemployment benefit. It's much more difficult for this type of platforms. Now, I want to make sure that we cover some of the issues that you, you have raised already, but I wanted to get back to you precisely on this. So what is the solution? I mean, we've been discussing quite a few. No, 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 no. The solution for this particular problem. So you're, you're suddenly. I mean, you, you are imp neither employed nor unemployed. You're a different sort of worker. Well, you're, I mean, we we have in countries like Portugal or my own country, Spain, etc. The share of self-employed is quite yes, quite large. Mm -hmm. And the differences between this new type of, of jobs uh, and and self-employed are not too too large. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, what we need to do is to deepen a little bit into the tools that we've been using to ensure these workers, which are not dependent workers. Yes. Okay? So now we have a problem, uh, which I, I foresee for the future, is suppose with the platform economy you, you have your app for Uber and for Lyft, and that's open, and all of a sudden they call you from Uber or they call, call you from Lyft. How are you going to control for social security contribution, yeah. which is the employer, which is using you? I'm, I'm here in this example is simple because there are two, but suppose there are ten. Yes. And in continuous time, you're changing from one to another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's 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 a real challenge mm -hmm. in in that respect. Uh, for the, for I mean, as I said before. Uh, the big, big challenge is how we are going to change our institutions to help these people who are going to be displaced by machines. Remember, mm -hmm. there is a bit of confusion because as uh, David and uh, co-authors have, have shown, uh, the, the, the original or the new, uh, uh, the, the, the new feature of this second machine age or, or fourth industrial revolution is that the, these robots are replacing tasks. They are not, a job is a bundle of tasks, okay? I'm a professor, I need to talk well, I need to know how to use a computer, I need to know uh, how to do research. There are various tasks, 
compile into, into a single job. And the robot probably is going to replace me and do much better with, uh, in teaching, yeah. for instance, or now with availability through MOOC, and, uh, all these courses, etc. So we'll have to, to do more tutorials to the students and so on. So some, we are keeping some tasks and we are giving up some others to the... Yeah. To, to, to the, to, to the and, and in that respect, I think it's this transition which is really crucial. And for that, for instance, my problem, and I, I don't have a solution now, is how our social security systems are going to cope with that. And another threat which is coming, which is aging. Yeah. Okay? We know that the, in those sectors where the, where the workforce is older, there is more investment in, in, in these new forms of technological change. And we also know that all the people, uh, their, their skills get more obsolete to this technique. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a sort of catch-22 exactly. thing. And, and at the same time, for instance, in Europe, we are putting all these restrictions on migration, etc., etc., when in a few years we'll need, the, we'll need them, badly need them. So I think these are big issues that have to be in the, in the policy agenda soon. Very well. So, I mean, one thing that is, in the sense, in the an, uh, undercurrent to this, and that some of you have mentioned already, and I think it's something that any parent gets a bit anxious about, is this notion that when we look at schools working, the way schools work, the kind of skills they transmit, they seem more or less the same they used to be 30 years ago. Schools work more or less in the same way, the same model. At the same time, we have this transformation that seems to demand a different sort of education, different sort of skills, different sort of training. So, I mean, Louise, I would start with you. Are, is this going on? Are schools changing enough, or do they need to change more? Yeah, I think, I think if, if you think about what machines are going to be able to do, the key word that David will, will use a lot tonight, hopefully, is, is because it comes from for some of his research. Uh, I also I also have worked on that. Is the idea of routine tasks? Mm -hmm. The idea. Think of your job. Everybody here, think one second of your job. So, what tasks that you do in your job? You could write a simple algorithm, a simple program that could do those tasks. Pick up this paper, put it in here, fill up some names, change it, file it away. Those are things that a computer could do. Now. The idea is that routine tasks are going to be automated. So it doesn't matter whether they're manual, things that you do, like tightening in a, in, a, in a conveyor belt in a factory, you tighten a screw, that's a routine task, or intellectual. Okay. Now, here's what is interesting. Many tasks that we thought were very hard end up being quite routine. Okay. Playing chess seemed hard. Playing chess, computers can do it much better. Okay. Driving seems hard. It seems computers are going to be driving pretty soon. Now, many tasks that we thought were very easy, like uh, you know, taking care of a baby, every human being has taken care of a baby for forever. That's not very easy at all, right? No computer, I mean, no robot is going to be taking care of babies for many tens, tens of years. That's pretty sure. So what are these tasks? And how does, what does that mean for education? So I think these are tasks that have a social and emotional component that have a, a kind of so, something to do with human interaction, something to do with the meaning of, of our life and our interaction. We could go to a cafe and ask for a coffee from a machine. We stick a coin in there and the machine gives us the coffee. But nobody goes to a cafe where the machine is giving you the coffee. You want a waiter. You talk to the waiter, they say, hey, how are you this morning? And you say, your latte, triple, whatever. So there are a lot of tasks that could be done, but that aren't done. And now, when you think, okay, so what does that mean for education? I think what it means for education is the education as we design it now is 19th century education, mainly for routine tasks. You learn to repeat orders, right? You memorize things, and you know how to go through procedures. What are, the number of the, what are the names of the rivers? This river, this river, this river. In the age of Google, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Google tells you the names of all the rivers in Portugal in like split seconds. <coughs> now, what are the things that would need this non-routine aspect? Well, it's going to have to be, you, kids are going to have to learn to think. They're going to have to learn to work in teams. They're going to need to learn to relate. They're going to learn, need to learn 
to work abstractly. It's an education. I don't know if you think of models, and some of you know our education. It looks to me like a Montessori school, right? I had, I had my kids in a Montessori. My stepkids have gone to a Montessori school. You see that kind of approach where there is a lot of learning together, a lot of drawing, a lot of creativity, a lot of other tasks that are not just industrial age education. Let's just get through this, memorize <coughs> all this. That's my sense. I don't see school systems moving in that direction. Um, of course, we could talk also about universities and, and both schools training and everything, but my, my, my biggest sense is we need to move the school away from memoristic, repetitive tasks towards social and emotional and non-repetitive and abstract tasks. Of course, math and all that is probably part of it as well. Jean, do you agree? Are we stuck still in the 19th century industrial revolution model of education? Oh, yes, I'm, um, I'm frightened by the degree to which uh, I mean, our education system is lagging behind. Um, it's still, uh, it's still very much, uh, as you said. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, even if you're, you know, when when you're, you want to do debate with your students, you realize uh, how unprepared they are for a for a structured debate, mm -hmm. which is what really we want people to be able to. So, sort of a, to be rational, to use information, to listen, uh, you know, not to just to take side. The debate is not. Um, just expressing your opinion or fighting against someone else. It, it, a proper debate is that you listen, you try to learn, try to distinguish, to, you separate out what you agree, what you don't agree with. You try to understand why you agree, why you don't disagree, uh, why, why, why you don't agree. And all that is very difficult. And all that is you know, precisely what you would wish people, you know, more sophisticated people to do. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they arrive at university and they're completely unprepared to that. I mean, they're better prepared in some countries. For example, they're better, I teach in Germany, they're better prepared in Germany, mm -hmm. no doubt. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I think it has to do with history, that this country, you know, use debate at school as a way to sort of uh, overcome uh, the, bad, um, the bad legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but uh, in many of our countries, it's not the case, and I think it, uh, it ought to be the case. Now, another point about education I wanted to make is that, you know, there is, a, there is an issue we don't have really a solution to. We used to be saying the, the response to automation is education. Mm -hmm. And so we were basically saying the more you, it's, it's a, the race between automation and education. So people get more educated, they are going to be uh, fit for the type of jobs that are going to develop. Yeah. Now, uh, David Otter, who is here tonight, has shown that this, it's not what's happening. That we are, you know, our economies are creating, in the US economy especially, is creating low skill job and high skill job and middle jobs are disappearing. Yeah. So that's uh, that the routine and that the routine element, including in you know, fairly sophisticated middle class jobs. And so the social problem we're facing and the political problem we're facing is that you know, we're going to tell people invest in education, but at the same time there is a sort of valley of death yeah, yeah, yeah. before you reach a point where education pays off. So uh, I think that's, that's politically extremely dangerous and socially extremely dangerous because you, know, you can tell people uh, you've got to, to change your way of doing things, you've got to adapt, you've got to learn new skills, etc. But at some point, uh, something needs to, this investment needs to pay off. If you're not able to tell them uh, this is going to pay off, I mean, they may go for different type of solutions. So what's the alternative? Well, <laughs> the, 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 we don't have an alternative. We, we don't, can't don't change. We don't, we don't change. We don't don't change. No, no, but, 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 but the, the people, people are going to tell them there are alternatives. They're going to tell them we stop we can stop technology. They're going to tell them, you know, let's close, uh, let's close yeah. the borders, etc. I mean, the various, the populist response to it uh, is, uh, you know, there's there, there plenty of bad responses. Juan, what's your view on this? No, I just wanted to add to this discussion uh, what I was saying before about the transition. And, and also looking towards the future, I, th I think education now is not something which is related to the, from the age of six to the age of 20. There's going to be lifelong uh, education. We, we are in front of many changes which are unprecedented and we don't expect at this moment. Who would have thought 30 years ago about the smartphone? Okay? So we really need these workers to be retrained properly. Yeah. And in this sense, uh, deepening and strengthening and changing a bit the nature of vocational training 
in, in, uh, along the lines of those successful countries in Europe uh, is, a, is, a, is a primary need. And uh, what people call active labor yes, market so, policies. Yes, and we'll have to subsidize firms to invest in their workers and so on and so forth. It will be in their, yeah, in, yeah. In their benefit. So we've been talking about a lot of things that seem, although in the abstract, desirable. So active labor market policies, changes in education, different modes of addressing this transition. But the issue is, I wanted to move you to the issue of the political economy of this. I mean, do we have the political conditions, the political actors invested in these sort of changes and what are the political obstacles? Because every change has winners and losers. Some people prefer the status quo. Some people prefer to resist the change. Uh, I mean, what's, I will start with you, Jean. So yeah. what is the political economy of this change? Well, let's start by saying, you know, what sort of thing we would wish to do. I think we would wish to equip people, to empower people, to give them the responsibility of policies is to give people the instruments uh, with, with which they, they, they're going to be able to cope with mm -hmm. all that. So we're speaking of education, you know, it's not the responsibility of the employer to train the, the worker, especially in the platform economy, but also in more general, if there is much more mobility. It's not only the responsibility of the state, uh, which has responsibility for, you know, initial education. It's, it's, it's going to be the responsibility of the people. So they need to be, to be provided with, with tools. What does it mean? It means a way of, of financing, so there needs to be you know, ac accounts and with uh, rights that you accumulate. There needs to be a lot of transparency in the, uh, in the professional education market, continuous education market, because it's in, I mean, in, in the country I know best, as we mm -hmm. tend to say, it's not transparent. I mean, you don't know the quality of it, you don't know the performance, you don't know the kind of, uh, you know, what it delivers in terms of access to, to job. So we need to bring much more transparency there. They need to be performance evaluation so that people, okay, they have, they have the means to, to finance, they have access to the suppliers uh, of education, they can make their choice. Now, is it sufficient? No, it's not sufficient because you know very well that uh, you know, many of our fellow citizens have had a bad experience with initial education. Mm -hmm. uh, so they feel you know, ashamed because they did not perform well at school, etc. Uh, so they need support. They need also institutions that support them, that help them make their choice. It's not to make the choice for them. It's not paternalistic. No? So we have to find the right balance between mm -hmm. being paternalistic and just telling people just to buy your own, it's, it's your own choice, we, we don't care. Okay? So, so that's, uh, I think, what, uh, what has to be done and, uh, and, and, and what's, you know, I mean, it requires a number of reforms, but it requires also a change in, in attitudes. But no, but let, let me press you a little bit on the this point. still. It's because uh, a lot of these changes, their benefits are visible on the medium run or the long run. Yeah. But political actors very often are driven by the ability to show short-term benefits. So how do we get the kind of consensus that, it's, especially in these so polarized times, for investment on the long run, policies that deliver long run benefits. I'm not, I don't agree it's going to be long run. Okay. You know, I mean, we're facing many, I mean, th those changes, they are coming now, right? Okay. They're coming now. And uh, many people see that uh, they're losing their, their job or their, the, the profession uh, they're part of is, uh, is losing its market, that they have to retrain. Uh, so it's now that we have to, to invest in it and, and, and create those tools. Okay. Um, and the, the perception that things that are changing is there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not, we're not telling people, you know, it's going to come and, uh, as if they, they, they didn't see it. They see it. They see it. I mean, every, each of us sees it on, you know, we use the, 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 the phone. Daily we, all know, yeah. we all know what the phone is, is able to do. Uh, and if you go, for example, you know, take the, the insurance business. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I spoke recently to an insurer. I mean, they, it was all based on those routine tasks, you know, analyze the financial analysis, etc. All gone. I mean, you know, machine can do it. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. going to be transformative in, in, in really the years to come. So it's now. Mm -hmm. Luis, your so view on this? The, the, politics, the politics are a nightmare, right? Because you have, the political economy is a nightmare. So you have the populist response, 
which is really appealing. The populist response says that's uh, Trump, Brexit, uh, on the right, uh, Orban, but also on the left, uh, you have the response on uh, Spain's Podemos. You also have here left, left wing populists, so uh, communists, etc. So the, the, that response is very simple. It's like, okay, stop this train, we're getting out of it. Okay? We just don't like this where it's going. We're going to go, well, like Trump says, make America great again. What he means is like, let's go to all these old times where, you know, we were all, we were all kind of, uh, there were only whites and we were all well, uh, uh, had two cars and uh, there was no, no technology and so on. So he's looking for some nirvana that never existed, of course. Then there is the response, I would say, of, of the other parties that are basically maybe having a lot of old people among the voters, which are basically closing their eyes. Okay? They say, well, they're just still talking about the same things as if nothing was happening. Well, because the voters don't want to hear it much, right? I mean, and here I'm biased, okay? So I put my, bi my, my bias on the table as I, I belong to a, to a sister uh, uh, movement of the one that the Macron put, uh, which is Tidanos and so on. I think there is an answer on the, on, the, on the liberal side or the progressive liberal side, which is to say, look, these things are happening and not in the long run. They're happening in the short run. And you need to build coalitions. And the coalitions are hard to build because, as you said, the people who are affected in many cases say, well, let's postpone this. Let's close borders and let's see how much longer I can, I can hold on to this. People don't want to see the big change. But I don't think we can stop it. We need to retrain. We need to regulate these things. I think there's a policy at the, at, the, at the country level. At the country level, you need to protect your citizens and you need to have a welfare state that, that allows people to thrive, that allows people to enjoy those changes, that allows people to feel safe. And then at the European level, Europe needs to really act together to regulate Facebook, to regulate Uber, to increase competition, uh, to increase tax, because one thing that's happening is all these countries, don't, all these companies don't pay any tax. You know where Starbucks buys the, the, the coffee? Buys the coffee in Luxembourg. Luxembourg, which produces lots of coffee, right? <laughs> no, it does not. But of course, you buy the coffee in Luxembourg, you pay a lot for the Luxembourg coffee if you're a Starbucks, you don't make any profits in Portugal or in Spain or in England. And then Luxembourg buys the coffee from Brazil at a very low price. So all the profits from Starbucks are in Luxembourg. Luxembourg, yeah. So what it means is that part of what's happening is the states are not able to react to this because the tax base is eroding. So we need to act together. And Europe, I think, on, all, on many of these things, on actually regulating the platform economy, on regulating and, and uh, ensuring there is competition, on all these things, has to complement the welfare state by acting together at the European level. Yeah. Juan. Well, I think a novel, a novel feature of, uh, of what we are seeing these days is that, of course, technological progress is mostly affecting the middle class. So there is this uh, called hollowing out hypothesis. Of course, those with higher skills are doing very well because they are the engineers designing the robots. Mm -hmm. The robots are replacing the routine tasks done by, by the accountants, by, by, by typists, no, yes. by so on and so forth. And then, of course, they are outsourcing a lot of uh, services at home, I don't know, cleaning, ironing, etc. So the, the, the low-skilled guys will do a little bit better. Of course, those who lost their jobs in the middle class will go to get a job in the low-skilled uh, segment, yeah. and, and maybe wages won't, won't move as much. Yeah. But it's the middle class. Of course, the middle class is a critical a, a, politically speaking, it's a critical group. It's what we call the bivotal vote. Yeah, yeah. So in that respect, you, I, I could foresee like two movements. One which leads to populism, which we are seeing in many, many countries, and another one which leads to some reforms which go in, 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 in a more sensible way. And I think it's the ability of uh, the, our leaders, etc., just to choose one road or the, or the other. So, but I think it is very important. Remember, the welfare state, as we know it, comes from uh, all the suffering that took place in this continent after the Second World War, the, the, the two world wars. I mean, that was the origin, the suffering, the size of the suffering, the bloodshed. And now we have a large group of the population which is going to suffer as well. Yeah. Very I, well. No, go, go ahead quickly because I, wanna yeah. people I, I want to people. I want to make a comment about. I mean, 
it, I mean, because of every time there is a period of transition, I mean, uh, it's obvious that we are all going to feel a little bit stressed out and worried. And, and we might sound too pessimistic. I mean, I think the bottom line is if you eliminate the routine tasks, the boring, repetitive, dead, soul-killing, deadening tasks, that's good. That's good, okay? There's a lot of people who spend their lives just filling up a form and putting it in a pile that doesn't exist, fine, okay? It's good. Now, if we are an aging society and we are more productive and we can do many more things with machines, that's also fine. So there is a lot of very good things, like you're gonna have a phone, you know that the new Apple Watch is going to take your EKG, your electrocardiogram all the time, it's going to know if you have a heart condition. Okay. So there's a lot of things in your health and in your, our everyday life that are going to be extremely positive of all these technological changes. The thing is, we need, as societies, we need to control what happens. We don't need to just let these things happen and whatever happens, that's fine. We need to decide what happens and manage it in a way that it helps us. That's the challenge. And I think it can be done. So it is not a, a moment to just like, you know, panic and close our eyes and, and, and vote uh, for Trump or something. <laughs> Very well. So let's see how much panic do we have in the audience. Uh, queria desafiar-vos a colocarem perguntas. Só pedia que as, só pedia que as perguntas fossem, fossem breves. E de onde é que vem a pergunta? Dali. Atenção. É falar para a zona preta, sim. Thank you very much. Um, I would like you to ask two brief questions because although I believe that it's good automation, I'm quite pessimistic about it. So I would like to know your idea on um, the role of the bias towards qualified workers. You talked a little bit about it, but you didn't really talk about the measures that the welfare state can have to protect the unqualified workers in terms of the, the, the inequalities of wage and others that can happen. And also your take on the precarious. I find it very strange that you didn't talk about the precariat mm -hmm. and how the self-worker in, in reality faces a lot of challenges in terms of wage security and others. So I would like to hear your take on it. Thank you. Okay. Can we collect a couple of more questions? Are there more okay. questions? Here. Over there, over there. So can throw you pass, it. can you pass throw the microphone? Throw the, throw the ball. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I think there's more to America than Trump. And um, I wanted to hear you especially uh, given your American experience, uh, there was a time when American universities showed the way. Some of us uh, believed in that. However, it seems to me that Europe has not changed fast enough. I am from Nova University, uh, by the way, which took the American model, uh, and there are a few others. Whereas, for example, China has managed, with one difference which I think is relevant for the discussion at hand, the role of the alumni. The role of the alumni is crucial in American universities and they are a force of sustainability. Once again, in Europe, we don't have a European equivalent to MIT, let's say, and I'm from Yale, so I'm being uh, very unbiased. So I wanted to pick your brains that there is more to America than Trump. I know it's hard to believe right now, but Luis, you can do it. Thank you. Very well. George, can you pass it to the next person over there in front? Oh, you. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, so um, you were talking about the, the Uber economy uh, and all the platforms and so on. So my question there uh, is, how specifically will you see the transition happening there? Because the impact will be in autonomous vehicles uh, very fast, like Jimmy Wells was mentioning uh, yesterday. So how do you see in that sector, the transition happening. Um, and the other th question is um, regarding the change, uh, the control of the change. Do you see already uh, current examples of that? Okay, so I think we, we can gather more questions later. So we have a first question about 
we or you didn't talk about enough okay. about the precariat and about mm -hmm. the solutions for unqualified workers. Then we have a question, a very different question about the, the example that American universities set in contrast uh, in George's opinion with the kind of inertia in Europe and then the question about the speed at which this platform economy uh, is taking place and further consequences. Can I so, the precariat? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so I want to talk about the precariat because you're right that um, I mean, because we also talked about, uh, about, about uh, the whole routinization, we didn't talk enough about. So the, the idea of the precariat is from Guy Standing. It's an English, uh, a London-based uh, social scientist. And he talks about this. He calls it a new class of workers who live a precarious existence and essentially are just basically holding on without really perspectives, without really the sense that their life is leading somewhere. Um, so he talks about people who, are, who have done some studies, who are kids of, of, of parents who, who maybe were workers, and then the kids do some studies, but they discover they cannot get a steady job. They keep living in their parents' house. Immigrants, maybe, similarly. Now, it's true that the Uber economy, it, for some people, is making the precariousness of the existence even worse, because, as, as Jean said, they don't have access to... Uh, to, to uh, insurance, when, when they don't have a job, when there is nothing to deliver, when you have a broken arm, you cannot be the delivery person, there is nothing to deliver for you, you're really going to stay at home and nobody's going to be paying you some money to, or when you get pregnant or something like that. So, correct? I think, and I think the place that was one who was pushing and was, which we are all pushing is you, you want to make, to the extent possible, social protection for self-employed and for workers as close as, as possible. Once the distinction between self-employment and working starts to be very valid and it starts to lose meaning, then you really need to manage to erase those distinctions that are a bit arbitrary. Um, a, a couple of American uh, uh, social scientists, uh, Kruger and who's the, who was the other one? Harris. Harris and Kruger have made a proposal about independent workers. They said, okay, look, there is all this other class of workers that you need to really consider. And the idea is people who work for Uber, people who work for these kinds of jobs, you need to basically assimilate it more or less to workers. I think that's, that's where the world is going. Of course, in America, these people don't even have health. In Europe, they do have health. So at least the health is already, the health status is already independent of whether you're a worker or not in Europe. And that's already a big thing. And that's where we should be going. You should have an unemployment insurance. You should have some sort of benefit. And I think a negative income tax would work like that. Because you would say, OK, I'm only this month, I'm only earning, this year, I'm only earning 3,000. Between 3 and 12,000, there is 9. And if it's a 50% negative income tax, I get 4,500 more, which allows me, maybe it was because I broke my arm, maybe it was for whatever reason, I am going to, to have this extra income. So you're right, maybe we didn't focus specifically on the precariat. But this kind of approach is exactly designed for this kind of jobs. The other aspect is the precariat exists in part because of regulatory reasons. We have a dual labor market regulation. All three of us have spent a big part of our career as labor yes. people working against. Juanjo has been leading a proposal yeah. for more than well, 10 years, <laughs> much more than 10 years, 20 probably. I joined 10 years ago, but this much longer, to eliminate dual labor markets to have a single contract that, that includes all workers so that you don't have a class of workers who are temporary and a class of workers who are permanent, the temporary don't have any protection. So it's exactly the same idea as let's eliminate this artificial distinction with uh, self-employed, let's eliminate the artificial distinction that does not allow us to protect temporary workers. So that, that, those are two issues that I think you would want to consider. Yeah, let me continue. Uh, per perhaps with the first observation, which is a bit different, which is that if you look at the second. US and you look at the share of um, precisely people working on platforms and how much money they make, it's not growing. Uh, and there is evidence that there is a cyclical dimension there. Okay. You know that the, the US economy is creating many jobs. Uh, firms are now competing to attract workers. and you know, pre pre people prefer a more stable job, a better paid job, than those, you know, relatively lousy jobs. So you're seeing that. And you're seeing actually when, the, when, when someone's incomes goes down, people tend to substitute by working on a platform. So 
what's, it's telling us is that uh, you know, what some people call a high-pressure economy also helps in terms of quality. The precariat is not just a result of labor market institutions or behavior, it's also the result of the, state of the overall state of the economy. Yeah. And we have a long way to go in Europe until we, uh, we're returning to a high-pressure economy. We're not yet there by far. So that's why we are also we seeing those type of, of, uh, of jobs developing here. Now, on, on what you said and, and on which uh, uh, I, I agree, let me complement with something. Uh, I think a lot of what we said is let's make things as universal, as portable as they can be. Okay? So uh, everything having to do with uh, health insurance, uh, with pension, with training, you know, you can mention others should be as universal as they, they, they can be. They're, they're so, sort of universal rights. Now, how to deal with this people with a particular type of, of, of contract? And uh, you, 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 you mentioned that. There are some people who say, let's transform them into regular labor contract. Let's consider that if you work for a platform, in fact, you're an, an employee because you're subordinated to the company. In part, it's true, but in part, it's not true. And in part, you know, some people have chosen this type of job because they want to be independent and they value yeah. their independence. You can't treat them, you can't tell them you're just, you know, subordinate in the same way as someone who comes to the office at nine in the morning and leaves at, at five in the afternoon. They're not, it's not a reality. Uh, then there's a solution of the independent. I mean, you, you said at some point, you know, they, they like the independence. I don't think they really like the, the traditional independence. The traditional independent had capital. So they were basically people having a little capital. They wanted to, you know, run a shop. Yeah, run a shop. Right. And then the, the capital was their insurance. Okay. Yeah. And so when they would re, they would sell, resell their shop, and that would be their pension. So they didn't want to, you know, contribute to a pension system because they had their capital. We're speaking of people without capital. Yeah. So it's 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 different. Yeah. And then the idea of a of a of a, of a silo, a special silo for them, I don't find it very attractive. So I think we should, I mean, it, but that's ambitious. We should have a sort of uh, basis of universal labor rights that apply to everyone. That should include you know, non-discrimination, gender equality, right to collective uh, negotiation, a number of things. And, and that would apply to everyone. And on top of that, there would be special, you know, I mean, things that would apply to the independent, something that would apply to the normal wage earners, things where they would apply perhaps uh, to, to platforms. But, you know, makes the system more adapted and more consistent with respect to the variety of things there are. Yeah. Juan, your views? Well, I, I agree with uh, what Jan just said. It's avoiding a race to the bottom. It's a bit like with uh, uh, capital taxation. I mean, if we keep on lowering our corporate taxes in order to attract further inflows, eventually that interest rate will be zero or negative. Yeah. Therefore, who pays the taxes? It will be the workers rather than the, than the capitalists. So here is a little bit the same. It's avoiding a, a, an inefficient equilibrium, which is uh, basically lo uh, shifting all the tax uh, load over to, a particular group of workers. Um, in that respect, I mean, adding to what it has been said, I think for, for uh, labor market regulations, given that this technical progress is, is displacing yeah. workers, I think it's important to have, uh, to go back to this idea of flex security, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, which has been implemented in, in a way, I mean, the Portuguese miracle, the last year miracle goes in that way, mm -hmm. uh, in, in some of the Nordic countries. So yes. you don't protect the worker, you, you don't protect the job, you protect the worker. And I think this, this is a, a message which has to be very clearly done. You can't, you can't fight against all this displacement of workers, but you're going to create a lot of mismatch. You need to worry about these workers, and you need to train them to, to have access to these, to these new jobs. And uh, besides that, uh, I think uh, that's the most important thing. About the, the precariat, uh, the precariat is, a, is an artificial... Uh, regulation, which came from the fact that uh, Sorry, some, the some countries uh, had a very, very high employment protection, and eventually, uh, because they came from, they were dictatorships, uh, countries like Portugal, like Spain, like Greece. So, in the dictators, in order to keep social unrest, they 
they, 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 they had a job for, for yeah, life yeah. for everyone. So when the transition arrived in all these countries, in, uh, it was just in the 70s with the oil price crisis, etc. So they needed to introduce some flexibility because the, the millions of jobs were being destroyed and they did it uh, in a two-tier way. They did it for the young people, for the, yeah. and so on and so forth. That's the origin that's of the, the duality. Of the that is, yeah. that's the, and, and I think, uh, uh, one, this is clear in our minds, I mean, dismantling this system shouldn't be so hard. Although there is, of course, the political economy of those who benefited from, sure. from, the, from this system. Sure. Um, the university thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the university yeah, question. The university thing uh, from George. Um, I mean, uh, universities are, are, are I, I agree with you. I mean, indeed, I, I've spent 15 years in, in one of the very best ones in, in, in Chicago, and I was, I was I mean, it's very impressive how, how well they work there. But it's true that u universities in Europe have been very hard to change and to, to follow those, those, those changes. I think universities are one of the institutions which are more resistant to change. You have uh, university professors, many of us here are. Um, they're used to a good life, and they don't want anybody to interfere with their good life. And uh, it's very hard for governments. And somehow, here's the surprise, George, I think. The key constituency to change universities should be students. Students should want better universities. They should be mm. complaining and protesting and saying, oh, my professor is still teaching me the same old notes from 30 years ago. <laughs> the, the surprising thing is that they don't do that. Yeah. The students are even more conservative than faculty in reforming universities. Students somehow, in our countries, which are all Portugal, Spain, France, Italy is the same, which have real, I mean, UK, maybe the Netherlands has, has, has done much better with universities, but in these countries, there hasn't been a constituency. Nobody in wow. society has been supporting a reform of the universities. There is no voice, but there is exit. <laughs> exit <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. People they, don't they complain. Vote, they vote where, where they feed. They, the yes. people who actually have a choice, they just go somewhere else, exactly. Yes. So very well. We can get a couple more questions. There's the microphone over there. Any, you want to ask a question? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, you didn't right answer control. him, but it's okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So the, many of us here, maybe not uh, uh, academically um, eco economists or anything related to that. I'm not. So these questions trouble me. And uh, this equation that seems a little hard to understand, uh, kind of a paradox between consumption and summing society, technology that leads to uh, competition lowers the prices as well, but there's also the loss of jobs and the loss of buying power. How do you think that we can address to this paradox that I said as new technology, everybody's searching for technology, but works are, uh, jobs are less, so can we, can the majority of us b buy really that smart watch that monitors our heart? Can we all buy that? Is that really important? How can we solve this paradox? How can you think about it? Okay, thank you. So let's collect, try and keep the question in our minds, and I think we can. Let's collect a couple more questions. Back over there, so there's a lot to throw now. Back there, can you raise your hand? No, you have to stand up. You, ne you, need, to, you need to cooperate, that's the thing. Uh -huh. That's a good way. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to ask something about what Luis said about if he gave his son money, he would just uh, play video games. Yes. And you <laughs> said something like it's he wouldn't develop skills and so on, but uh, nowadays. A lot of kids earn a lot of money playing games, <laughs> and it's a big reality nowadays. And even streamers and YouTubers, that's a new reality that maybe we should give incentive to kids to do that. <laughs> Instead, no, but it's true. Like, uh, I'm in informatics, and I feel that if my parents would let me be more geek, I would fit in a lot better than I do. And I do fit in a, a little bit, but not so much as my friends who play video games all, all, all their lives. 
and uh, it's a growing, the technology is a growing area, so maybe we should do the opposite, what our parents are trying to uh, let us do. Okay, so uh, we have only five minutes, and because we only have five minutes, and we have three people that might want to respond, so I, I want to ask you to respond now, and I'm sorry not for not allowing other people to ask questions, but I have this uh, clock over there looking at me. <laughs> so the first question is, we have all these technological wonders that people want to have access to, but apparently a lot of bad things happening. So this is one issue that you might, I think we addressed it partially, but you might want to address it again. And then this question that reminded me of something that you said, that 30 years ago, nobody imagined that smartphones would do what they do. But probably two years ago, nobody imagined that all these kids could be making a lot of money from playing video games. So there, there are things that we, there are to predict. So your reactions to these questions. If I may ask, uh, sorry, answer first your question. I mean, of course, nowadays, probably not everybody would afford it. But in 10 years' time, I mean, technological progress is so fast that the price of one of these gadgets will be very, very low. I mean, someone was saying yesterday, you can Jimmy buy Wales. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Wales, Wales. Yeah. You can buy a smartphone for $20, $20 or $29. So this, we will see that. Well, I think the question was also, you know, if I, lo if I lose my job in the process, how can I benefit from, yeah. from it? Yeah, and, right. and that's something we've seen before. I mean, that we've seen in, in history, let's think of, uh, you know, the transition from agriculture to industry. I mean, you know, there, there are disruptions along the road and there are people who are suffering. I mean, that's true. But in the end, the fact that there is more productivity in society benefits and, and increases the, the, the affordability of, of, of new, new things. So, you know, the, the people actually who lost their job in, uh, in the traditional, um, you know, uh, workshops uh, for textile, for example, because of the development of the, of the industry, they couldn't buy these new clothes. Uh, but eventually it uh, developed. So we're all speaking about, the, I mean, it's not a way to say the transition doesn't matter. The transition matters enormously and how we manage the transition to, to reduce at minimum those transition costs, that's essential. But let's not forget about the longer term. So um, on my, on my uh, slandering my own son, he's actually very hardworking and not, not just, <laughs> no, it's just an example. But I was, I was trying to make a point uh, a more general point, and I'll go back to your, to your narrower one. General point was, I mean, you see it in, in the, in the, uh, what's the, what's the British uh, filmmaker who makes these movies about the underclass kind of... Um, Ken, Ken, Loach. Loach. Ken Loach. You see it in the Ken Loach movies, and you see it in train spotting. You see this idea of a welfare-dependent uh, world where people are just getting the check and their life has no meaning. And that's what I was trying to get at. And that's the part that I, as an economist, don't really understand. Because for us, it's like, OK, you get a check, you should do better. But it's true that meaning comes from jobs. Could meaning come from the virtual economy, not just meaning, but even more skills and everything? Could just you make your life online? I think you could. I mean, I think more and more of what people accomplish um, has this kind of virtual content. And it gets me to your consumption question. If you think about it, you think about the presents you got from your parents or the presents you give if you're a parent. 20 years ago, there were big packages with paper around. There were atoms, right? There were big things that come in a truck. And many of the presents you give or you get now are electrons, right? You just get a, something that allows you to buy um, clothes for an um, avatar on uh, a video game or uh, movies that you see over Netflix or music that you hear over Spotify it doesn't have any, any, any materiality, that consumption. So that consumption, everybody can reach. Now, does it mean that we have to forget about gaining real-world skills? I, I don't think so. I mean, we're very good at, at meaning. Let me just leave you with a thought that I was, I was pretty uh, shocked but amused as well by... Um, um, Harry, Yuval Harari, the one who did Sapiens and so on, and he was talking about how people are so good at making meaning out of things, and he said, like, you know, there will be all these levels, and people will accomplish all these things online. He said, look, religion 
It's his words, not mine. He lives in his world. So religion is a virtual reality game. You have all these levels. If you get more points, if you're good, you get brownie points. And then you, at the end, you reach heaven, you know? So we've been, there are all these Orthodox Jews, he says, all these Orthodox Jews who spend all their life doing, quote, nothing. They're just reading a book. Yeah. That's what they do. And they get all these levels, you know, black belt kind of levels. And they're happy. Their life satisfaction is huge. So maybe in these video games, you know, people will develop this, you know, this satisfaction out of things that they will accomplish in this virtual reality. It's not impossible. I still would rather have my kid learn math than learn how to play <laughs> Fortnite. But that's another story. OK. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if you are more reassured about the future or more concerned after this discussion. The only assurance I can give you is that if you're interested in this topic, and you probably are because you're here, tonight we'll be hearing more about this uh, or rel and the related issues from David Otter. So in the meantime, I'd like to thank Jean and Luis and Juan for a wonderful conversation and to thank you for your questions. Thanks for hearing. This is great. <laughs>